So Lauren, it looks like we have everyone on the CNRA side and admitting folks that started to slow down. So we can probably yeah. go ahead and with a slow introduction and get started. All right, awesome. I'll pass it over to Ella. That sounds great. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this webinar about 30 by 30, ensuring data accuracy for impact and how to contribute. We are excited to have this conversation to further the impact of the recognition of conservation work in California. Before getting started, we have a bit of housekeeping. This meeting is being recorded and will be available on our website if you'd like to access it later on. So because of this, please keep yourself muted. You can put questions in the chat throughout the presentation, but we will also have a designated Q&A time at the end. For those of you that are not familiar with 30 by 30, in October of 2020, Governor Newsom issued Executive Order N8220, which established a state goal of conserving 30% of California's lands and coastal waters by 2030. The goal is intended to help accelerate conservation of our lands and coastal waters through voluntary collaborative action. It is crucial that we work with partners all across the state of California. As of now, we are reporting 24.4% of lands and 16.2% of coastal waters as conserved. That said, we are aware that there's a lot of data missing from these numbers. And Amanda, you can go to the next slide. So because of these data inaccuracies, Lauren and I have spent the past few months doing outreach with agencies all across California with the goal of improving the data accuracy of 30 by 30. The initiative relies on land managing agencies to self-report the conservation status of their lands, and we are here today to help you learn how to do that. We've created a few resources that we will share throughout the presentation today, and we hope that you will utilize these as necessary. Thanks. I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Amanda Kohanek, Spatial Data Automation Manager and Senior Project Manager at Green Info Network. She is here to speak on the process of adding and updating lands for 30 by 30, um, and more broadly in the California Protected Areas Database, or CPAD, and the California Conservation Easement Database, or CCED. So thank you so much, Amanda, for being here. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to be here and appreciate the invitation. Thanks to everyone attending. And uh, we're going to go through, as they said, uh, a couple of things here. First of all, CPAD and CCED, but then also how those all work towards 30 by 30 data. Um, first, a very quick intro, Green Info Network for any of of you who are not familiar with our work, we are a nonprofit uh, organization. We've been around since 1996. We're predominantly in California, though we do have staff spread across the US. We're normally around a, a dozen staff at this point. Uh, we predominantly work in GIS and data along with interactive online maps. Um, and we also help with strategy and communication such as reports. So I want to start today by talking about the California Protected Areas Database, which is a database that's been around for a number of years, um, over 20, I believe, at this point. This is a GIS spatial database, which is intended to inventory all public lands that are fee owned, so fee title ownership, by an agency or organization in the public interest across the state. So that can mean uh, national held lands such as U.S. Forest Service, as well as state lands, state parks, county, city, and also uh, nonprofit organizations. So it's a variety of lands. Uh, we are continually updating this data. It is published twice a year. So twice a year, we send out a new link to all of the refresh data that includes all the updates made in the previous six months. Months. Our most recent release was the 2024A that came out in June, and the next one is expected to come out in December. Uh, we're currently at about 49.9 million acres across the state of California being represented within the California Protected Areas database. I will note that it's a free and open data set. It's available online. There will be links later on. We're also happy to follow up. Um, with information on how to download it, but you are free to download and use uh, CPAD and the next database I will talk about, CCED, um, and any elements of your work, whether they be 30 by 30 or outside of that in your public interest work. So 
uh, the second database that we have is the California Conservation Easement Database. This is a complementary database, which is smaller in terms of the total acreage of cover coverage, 2.6 million acres. Um, and these are lands that are protected through a conservation easement. Uh, those properties are then tracked slightly differently, but mostly in line with CPAD, um, a little different information on the attributing. But essentially, this is uh, quite similar to CPAD, and we're looking at all lands across California for any agency uh, protecting in via conservation easement. So today, the broader talk is about the fact that CPAD and CCD are foundational databases for 30 by 30. So in order to be a part of 30 by 30, you first need to make sure that your properties are contributed and accurate in CPAD and CCD. However, I want to be really clear that just being in CPAD or CCED does not mean that that land then counts towards qualifying acreage in 30 by 30. We're gonna walk through this a little bit more, but the main message is here that you can't take CPAD and CCED data sets and expect that to automatically equal what goes into 30 by 30. What we're gonna walk through today is how the filtering essentially happens to make uh, to sub-select the data out of these two databases so that you could either replicate or understand the data if you choose to take it from another source as 30 by 30. So the reason for this, the reason that we can't simply take CPAD, CCD, add them together and call it the 30 by 30 element of the data is that parks can be many things. So if I ask you to think of a park or an open space, we all tend to have somewhat similar, um, but there is a really broad scope of things that we can consider. So one of the first things you might think of would be a state or a national park as shown here. We're thinking of a lot of open space, not really much if any development, um, light use by the public coming through trails or uh, viewing typically. But also there are things such as regional parks. So you might have uh, similar open spaces, also large scale, uh, lots of acreage within them with some public access or restricted access. So those are sort of the more common typical things you might think of when you think of open space and parks. And these are certainly things that we would expect and consider to be a part of the 30 by 30 element. Um, but there are a lot of other things that are tracked, in particular through CPAD, the protected areas for fee title, um, which is recreational resources. So it's also critically important that the state of California provide, uh, you know, play spaces for small children, adult play fields, etc. So these are all also tracked within CPAD. Sometimes they're offering biodiversity um, and thus can count towards 30 by 30, but other times they're solely based uh, they're solely intended to serve a recreational or public outreach element. Um, another example would be community gathering spaces that are public out in the open. They can be considered community public resources in an open space element, but they're not as likely to provide a biodiversity element, which is really the, the core foundation of what we're looking for in 30 by 30. So these latter examples are a little bit of reasons why you can't just take CPAD. You would want to filter out some of these properties that are not serving the biodiversity element. So taking a look at just a sub area of the state, I want to explain where we're at now and why we're having this webinar in terms of outreach and hopes to hear back from all of you to make sure our data is accurate um, as can be and we continue to update it over time. So you can see on the map here, those areas shown in blue, the darker blue are protected by fee ownership the lighter blue in easement. And then green is applied over the top if we know that they have been inventoried and qualified to count in 30 by 30. Now, if you're familiar with the Bay Area, you can look at this map and you may note that some of these blue areas you feel like should qualify by for 30 by 30. And indeed that may be the case. So what we're looking for is to say, okay, First of all, make sure your lands are in CPAD and CCED. And then also we'll walk through how you qualify your lands to be a part of the acreage that count towards 30 by 30. So what you need to do is submit additional information about those properties to ensure that we know they do count and they're accurate to be counted towards the total of biodiversity protection in the state. So let's talk about that a little bit more. How do you ensure that 
if you're being represented in CPAD and CCED, how do you know if you qualify to be a part of 30 by 30? Uh, the state has gone with the USGS Develop Gap Protection Level. And what that means is that there are key three key elements that need to be met by a property in order to count the acreage towards 30 by 30. The first is permanent protection from conversion of an unnatural state. So the property itself needs to be protected, but there also needs to be a prioritization that it will remain in, an, in a natural state. Um, if it's going to be converted, that may disqualify it from counting. The second is that we're looking for biodiversity. We're looking for minimizing unnatural disturbances on the land. We really want something that's protective for the environment as a whole and may not necessarily be serving recreation or lighter recreation or controlled recreation to make sure that the priority remains um, with the natural habitat. And then the third element is that we need an active and legally enforceable management plan that states we're how and that we will maintain that lay land in a natural state. So what this means is that if we have these three elements present on a property, that no, we now feel strongly that there's a foundation that will allow that to continue as stewardship for uh, natural lands into the future and thus should be counted in 30 by 30. So this is a pretty conceptual high level, but these are the three concepts of if you have a property, it's protected and you want to know if it counts to 30 by 30, these will be the three main topics or elements that will determine if it qualifies. Uh, so just to illustrate that a little bit more, um, these are through the GAP status code system, as I said, and we're looking at those that qualify being those that are GAP 1, which are um, highly conserved, or GAP 2. Those that are in GAP 3 and GAP 4 typically do not count towards 30 by 30. And we'll go a little bit more into detail as to what those are, and then we're also going to point you to a lot of resources so that you can understand the individual GAP codes and how they could be applied to your lands. Uh, so one of the sort of high level flow charts and resources we have, which we're not going to walk through in a uh, terrible level of detail today, but as a starting point is that we have a flow chart that sort of represents these three elements that I talked about, permit protection, if we have a management plan, if it's legally enforceable. So for some properties that are fairly straightforward in answering those three questions, you can quite quickly get to a gap code that's appropriate for your property. It's not always as easy as going through the flow chart. Some of you may have tried or um, run into questions, so we do have support and other ways to answer your questions, but this is a high level standing back view of how that works. Um, and then now I'm gonna pass it back over to Ella and Lauren to discuss uh, the next slide on case studies. Yes, thanks so much, Amanda. So we've kind of realized along this process that determining gap codes can be a tricky process as it's difficult to sometimes fit complicated land statuses into really tight definitions for gap codes, especially distinguishing between gap codes two and three. So since working with land managers to determine their land's gap status codes, um, we run into a few common scenarios that we call our case studies which we think are really helpful to share in order to provide clarity around these definitions. So we're gonna take this opportunity to send out our case studies document, which illuminates a few of these common scenarios and how to assign gap codes to them. Um, we're choosing to highlight one case study in particular, as you can see on your screen, that you, might, you may find especially relevant if you are a land trust or managing land without a management plan. Um, so this case study demonstrates a few things. First, that LTA accreditation for land trusts automatically implies that land is being managed under a management plan. Second, managing a property under an organization-wide plan counts towards um, the requirement to be considered gap code one or two. So we find that this example in particular may clear up some questions related to the concept of management plans um, included in the gap code definitions. Uh, and this case studies document is a really great resource to reference uh, to provide clarity around these gap codes and answer the questions that other land managers or other entities may also have. So yes, you can find it in linked in our chat and I'm gonna pass it back to Amanda to discuss how gap codes are used to determine which lands are included for 30 by 30. Great, 
Thank you. Um, and just a quick scan of the chat. I didn't have a ton of time, but I want to make sure everyone knows both the recording and the slide deck um, as well as folks to help you if you need resources are available after this. So don't feel that you need to get all the information in the moment. You will have access to both these slides and any materials um, in the future. So, so let's uh, dig in a little more. As I said, as a reminder, uh, CPAD and CCED are freely available data sets, but it's not as simple as taking those two, pulling them together, and then you have 30 by 30. Instead, what we have is we want CPAD, where we know those lands are assigned a gap one or a gap two status, the same for the easement database. When you add those two together, you get 30 by 30. So if you were to download CPAD and CCED, you could replicate the same process. There are fields that are quickly accessible. So you could say CPAD, CCED with these two set filters and you would return um, a pretty similar element to what 30 by 30 is. There are very modest differences, but those could be addressed if need be. Uh, so where we're at now, um, this is a representation of the website. Uh, CNRA does have a live website where you can interact with the data itself on a web map, if you like, and see where we are in terms of status. Uh, we are expecting an update coming up in the next month or two, I believe, uh, where CPAD release from 2024A that came out in June will be refreshed to this website. So in, in the coming months, we do anticipate an update, and that will continue over time as we move towards 30 by 30 and make data improvements, um, we will be refreshing both CPAD, CCED, and then this website will reflect those changes also. So you can start to monitor the prog progress over time and uh, the link is accessible here if need be. It is important to note both this talk today and the data on this portal do not currently represent the marine element of 30 by 30. Um, there are efforts uh, happening on that and there is coordination between the two, but the data are quite different um, and the nuance is needed. So these are purely the terrestrial acreages that we're discussing. Uh, so as I alluded to before, but just to be really clear, the problem is that Green Info Network network has data. We feel quite confident that it's in the 90th percentile in terms of accuracy, hopefully the 90% of knowing where properties are protected, in particular in fee ownership. Um, but what we're not as sure about is the gap code assignment. Uh, there have been elements where we've been able to assign national properties, uh, nationally managed, and state. Those are a little easier to address. But when we get down to the local level, we really feel that the folks who own and or manage the properties themselves are the most knowledgeable. And we would like and encourage them to submit the gap codes they feel are most appropriate. So this is an open invitation and request for all of you who work at organizations that manage properties in California that you feel may uh, qualify for 30 by 30 to give us that information. So as noted here, the solution is we're asking all of you for your help. Many of you have already, um, and each six months along with the CPAD CCED release, we do reflect those gap code updates that you send to us. So today I wanna walk through the solution is that we're hoping for your help. We've been receiving it and we want more, and I wanna give you guidance on how you can go about doing that and how you could get started in that process. We're asking you, first of all, to review the data that is in the fee and easement database uh, resources. And once you have a look at that, just making sure, do we have your properties ac accurately represented? If you've protected something new, you can let us know. Um, there are a number of ways you can do this, and we'll discuss that a little bit. This is just a high level sort of summary of what we're hoping to see you do. The second is learning enough about gap codes and as they apply to your property that you could inform us what you think the most accurate gap code is. Uh, once you feel that you're ready, you could then assign those gap codes and then return that uh, information back to us. Now, we do have a number of ways you can go about this, and that's what we're going to walk through now, um, one of them being a toolkit that we'll walk through, uh, and that's accessible via this link. But let's go ahead and get a bit more into the detail. Um, I will start off by saying that one resource we have is on the CA Lands website, um, all of the information that we've collected to date. So if you decide after this webinar you're interested in the toolkit, this would be where you could go download that information, find your agency's properties, download it, um, fill in the information, and return to us. We also have all sorts of documentation and information about both databases, um, as well as our contact. If it's too overwhelming, you're always welcome to reach out to, in particular, Green Info, just saying, 
I need help understanding, we can set up small uh, short calls or emails, whatever fits your needs. We also have, as shown here, resources about GAP um, to have sort of higher level and or links to summary information out of USGS that's more formal that may assist you through the process. We do have directions on how to move through the toolkit as well as frequently asked questions. Uh, so it's key to us that we keep the data current. It's always changing, and that's uh, typically a positive way in that more and more lands are being protected and protections are increasing. So we need to keep up with that work. Um, the changes that you submit can help us determine which lands are supposed to qualify or not for 30 by 30. Um, and then we continue to improve and expand and correct entries with what the information you give us. As I noted, um, all the databases are continually updated on a daily basis. And then every six months, you see those um, pushed out to the public in an official release of the publication of the new data. Um, and I will note, you can submit new or revised data at any time. If you submit information to us, either about a property or a gap code, and down the line you find that you need to make a revision, that's perfectly fine. You can always submit a revision to previous data. Um, so if you feel fairly confident but have a bit of a hesitation, it can help to note that you can come back and make changes at any point if you feel you need to. Um, so I, I think I'll guide today's the rest of the presentation through sort of a quick start guide in terms of walking through the steps of how you would actually go through this process yourself. We do hope it's an easy three-step process as shown here. You download the toolkit, which will contain options. Um, then go ahead and go through and review and contribute feedback to us so we can learn about your lands, as well as then send the information back to us. I will say I understand the devil is often in the details, so we'll go through part two in more uh, detail to hope uh, illuminate how that goes perhaps prompt questions that folks want to put uh, into the chat as we go along and return to, um, or hopefully just serve as a guide so you feel a little more familiar with the process. So with that, I will say the first thing is uh, you want to go to this website uh, linked here and download your toolkit. When you open the website, as I'll show in just one second, you can start by entering the name of your agency or organization. It'll then present you with a file you can download and uncompress. Um, it's a zip format. So to actually just go ahead and show that, um, this is the website here that we have. And for this example, I'm going to go ahead and, and do Big Sur Land Trust. Um, so you can see you can put keywords. You could also put for example, Nature Conservancy. Um, so it's a keyword. It doesn't need to be the exact search. Um, you can also have the whole list accessible. Um, so this is showing the most current data for CPAD and CCED. So this gives you, the if you go download the official databases of CPAD, CCED, you see the latest release. If you come download your toolkit, you'll see any draft changes we have for you. So in the example of Big Sur Land Trust, if they had reached out to me and said, oh, I need to add a new property, I would add that to the database and then they would now see that reflected in their zip file. You can download other agencies if you have neighboring agencies that you think would be helpful or someone who's very similar and you would like to see what their properties are, um, you can access anyone else's, but this is a way to get a more limited data set and hopefully easier to work with as you do the review for your lands. Okay, so let's assume you went ahead and downloaded that property for Big Sur Land Trust. Um, you would have this here zip file that you can go ahead and extract. When you extract it, you're going to get, let me go back here, two things. You'll get what we call geodata and tables. So going back to the slide here, um, now you're going to start the more uh, in-depth section, and this is looking at data itself and contributing back. There are going to be two key things that you'll want to consider and decide. The first is the method in which you want to review the data. For some folks, um, they may just want to look at a tabular representation of the data. For someone who doesn't have GIS and or just isn't interested in using it for this task, we do have Excel tables. What this will do, and I'll show, is list um, all of the properties uh, that your organization is currently assigned as a manager for, along with key attributes. That will be the name that we have for the property, the size, if the public can access the, uh, access the property or not. And then it'll also have the opportunity to enter your gap code. 
Um, so we'll walk through that in more detail, but just to know the other second option here, uh, if you have and are familiar or comfortable with GIS, we do have shape files available. So if you wanted to look at this in an Esri product or QGIS, that's perfectly fine. Um, you will find uh, the same information. You will get the properties themselves, the names, the size, access, um, and gap code information can be filled in, but then you can also look at them spatially on the map in your GIS system. We don't by default include KML um, representations, but we're happy to send those to an agency if they're useful for you. So if you don't use a uh, more robust GIS, but do want to use KMLs, please reach out. It's a very quick process for us to add them. Um, we just don't have them by default because we find they're fairly uncommon and they bulk up the file and cause a little bit of confusion, but do reach out if you want those instead. Um, the second choice, so the first you're going to need to make is, um, are you going to look at the table versions or are you going to look at GIS? Um, and then once you've decided that, you want to think about if you want to assign gap codes at a property level or what I consider a parcel level. So if you look at this example over on the right, it's the Dangerman Preserve. And you can see it's a rather large property. Um, and if you look inside, these are actually representations of the individual parcels that are owned that build up to the larger park or property of the Dangerman Preserve. What we offer is that if you feel this property is just one gap code, it's gap code two, and you're done, you can just say, I want to look at the property as a whole, assign one gap code, and be done. Um, if instead you feel that some of your properties have areas that might be gap code two, either a gap code three, or any of those mixes, we do allow for you to submit different mixed gap codes within a property. But in order to do that, you're going to need to do a parcel level or detailed review of the data. So now that I've gone through that, I'm going to actually walk through an example so you can sort of see how this actually looks. Um, and so let me pull back this screen. So as I said, this would be the download zip file you get. It'll be named for your agency or organization. And when unzipped, you're going to get two things, the tables or the geodata. So we'll start with the uh, probably I would consider easier option of table review, especially for folks who don't want or need to deal with GIS. If you open this subfolder, you see that we have um, tables representing both CPAD and CCED. And then, as I said, with the detailed assignment being, I want to look at each individual parcel within a property or the singular assignment. So let me go ahead and show you what these tables look like. Um, I will start with a single assignment. So in this case, we're pretending that Big Sur Land Trust is doing their review, and they've decided that all of their properties as a whole can be assigned one single gap code. So they would open this Excel table. Um, you can see the reference by name here for each of those said properties, the level of access we have, that they are the manager, and then the size that we currently have um, for that property, the acreage of that. Now, you may feel that any of this needs revision. You're free to log those edits over here in the side. Um, but the main key thing, if you feel things are accurate, is to assign the gap code. So in this case, perhaps this first one they feel is a gap code two or three, they can go ahead and pick that from here save the file and send it back to us. So once you go through all of these, or you can do this in pieces, if you say, oh, you know, this month I can do half, next month I'll do the second half, it's fine to send um, partial data as you have it. Now, um, it may be in most instances helpful to actually still see the property itself. And so what we have here is a link to our Map Collaborator application. So if you click on this link here, what it's going to do is actually open a website that will take you to a map of the property you've selected. So in this case, you can see we're looking at the same property, uh, the Royal Seco Ranch, owner and manager of Big Sur Land Trust along with the property here. So if you would like a visual representation on a map without GIS, you do still have that option to view that here. Uh, the second option that we'll talk about on the level of review is perhaps I do happen to know that this ranch is rather large. Maybe they felt it was more appropriate to submit uh, mixed gap codes. Maybe part of it is gap two, part of it is gap four. That would be possible um, instead of using the singular assignment if we go with the detailed assignment table. So taking a look at that, you can see it's quite similar to the previous one. Uh, the difference is that you can assign multiple gap codes and you can also see that this 
ranch previously represented by one record is now represented by multiple. So this is where you then have the ability to say, okay, the sub parcels within the ranch can now be reached, uh, can, can be assigned to these smaller level parcels. So that, uh, in short, would really be it, downloading the table, extract, fill in the gap codes at either the detailed or uh, the higher level, saving the files, and then emailing them back to Green Info. That would be um, a perfectly uh, easy way for us to accept and ingest the information that you were able to provide to make sure your gap codes are accurate. Um, and we're doing that. So let me go. So the second thing I want to show I come back down here, is if you chose that you wanted to look at the data in GIS, so perhaps you have QGIS or ArcMap, Mark Pro, et cetera, and you would prefer to review the information there. When you download the data, as shown here, you can see the GeoData folder. This will contain, uh, these are in shapefile format. We find that the most flexible between various GIS programs. Um, so this is where you can find the similar three files, your easement data, the detailed assignment, if you want to do parcel level reviews of your properties or the singular assignment if you want to just do one uh, gap code per property. So looking at that in GIS, we have here again, Big Sur Land Trust. You can see the same property. You can zoom to that. So you can see in the instance here, the, the singular assignment that I have highlighted here in the teal is the one large property, the same acreage, and then the ability you can start an edit session, add uh, the gap code that's appropriate, and any notes you think you might want us to review. For example, if you felt the access should instead be open or the name has changed, whatever that may be, you can also add new properties. You can make revisions if you feel like um, you need to expand or change the boundary in any way. So you can make any of those types of edits. Um, if instead of doing the one level, if one gap code is not appropriate for this entire property, you can open the detailed assignment that I showed, which is here shown in the dash yellow line. And then you can see the individual parcels can be highlighted. Um, so this would allow for the assignment of different gap codes even within those parcels. And again, the chance to put notes about those. So I'm going to do a quick pause there for Ella and Lauren to make sure there aren't any critical key questions that need to be answered at this point. Um, anything on your guys' end that needs to be addressed? We've got a few questions, but we can save them for the Q&A and address them when you're finished. Okay. Go ahead and minimize those. Um, so this is mostly a recap reminder if you're coming back to the slide deck later. Option one is the table. This is a quick view of how that would look and then the map you would get as a representation. So this is what we've walked through, but just sort of a, a quick uh, future note if need be. And then the GIS option. And the one helpful other helpful thing here is that we're noting the key fields that we're asking you to review. CPAD and CC do, do contain more information, especially such as special, sorry, special use. So if there were a golf course or a community center, sometimes those things are noted, but really these key elements here are the main ones that we want to make sure we get feedback. Do we have the correct name? If the public is allowed to access it, um, who manages the property, et cetera. So these are the key fields that we're looking for uh, information on. So the, the next thing I'll say is that if this all still feels too hard or makes you uneasy, we do have other options. We actually have scripts where we could go through and produce PDF map printouts for each one of your individual properties. So here's an example on the side where if you said, I would really just prefer I have 10 properties, send me a map of each, and then I'll deal with that. That's an option. Uh, we can produce these maps and then email them to you to look at and review. Uh, as noted before, we can provide KML, KMZ, if you're more familiar or comfortable in Google Earth. And then one other key element I want to say is that if your agency already has GIS data and you feel like it represents uh, what you need to send to us accurately, you don't need to do the comparison to CPAD and CCED yourself. You can simply say, this is our most current up-to-date GIS data. Please review, compare, and update, at which point we can look at your files, compare, and if we have any questions, come back to you. Um, we do anticipate sort of one to three back and forth with an agency when they come to us, so don't hesitate to ask questions. We are here to help and walk you through the process if and when you find you need help through those. 
Uh, so how you can help is the number one thing is going and looking at the agency data uh, represented for your agency and letting us know if that looks correct. You can also uh, connect with other agencies that you're aware of to make sure they know about 30 by 30 and are participating um, and know that they can participate, that we're asking and hoping that they can provide information about biodiversity, which essentially becomes gap codes. Uh, you can also facilitate or participate in group discussions if you find there are other agencies similar to yours and you would like to either work together or confer to look for a conceptually consistent result. Um, that's a great way to go about it. And if you feel that Green Info could help in that, we're happy to join and or lead those discussions. Um, I will say that gap code assignment is pretty difficult in some instances. Others, it's quite easy. Uh, sometimes what we end up offering is a collection of questions that we can then present to USGS, who are in charge and run the system for GAP, and help get clarity from them on definitions. So we can help facilitate that. We're happy to give other presentations or just come to working group meetings as need be. Um, and then please always provide us critical feedback <clears throat> Feedback or recommendations if you find something in the toolkit is not working, if you think we could offer a different file format or meeting type or anything of that nature, um, we're certainly open to feedback on how we can make this process easier and more efficient on new. We know that most of you are quite busy and this is an additional task that will need to be done, so we would like to be as helpful as possible and make this um, as painless as we can throughout the process. Uh, so currently we have released, as I said, just recently in June 2024A. So if you want to look at CPAD and CCED, you can see those updates. And within the next uh, few months, you'll see that on the CNRA website reflected. That will include substantial edits to both CPAD and CCED in terms of new lands and also improvements and gap codes from agencies and organizations who submitted those over the last year. Um, and then we have ongoing engagement with folks uh, for questions, concerns, ideas. We're happy to have uh, webinars, one-on-one -on -one support, working groups. And then our email and contact information is available if you'd like to just reach out and find the best avenue for you. So that's our plan looking forward. And I think from there, we'll go ahead and open up for uh, Ella and Lauren to facilitate questions and answers. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, that was incredibly informational and helpful. Um, I'm going to start off with a question um, that says, how would organizations like those that manage large watersheds for water quality and park districts that have both recreational and natural resource protection missions demonstrate number two gap conservation for biodiversity? And I'm happy to give a little bit of information. And then if there's more you'd like to add, feel free to jump in too. Um, but I'll just start off by saying that large watershed uh, large watershed management and water quality is really important and is great for landscape connectivity. Um, that said, 30 by 30 is really based on the entire ecosystem health. Um, and so, you know, we want recreation. That's a really big goal of 30 by 30. Um, but that said, we also want to make sure that, you know, that biodiversity is number one, um, is the number one priority. So it's hard to kind of put a blanket answer to say if a large war water quality des designation would or wouldn't count. Um, but uh, also, as kind of Amanda was saying, you're able to break up a property into multiple different gap codes. And so if you believe that the wide majority of it, maybe 70 or 75 percent or 80, whatever the number is, would count, you're welcome to break it up. Um, but we do want to make sure that the entire ecosystem health is uh, kind of being prioritized for biodiversity in order to qualify as gap two. Yes, and um, I think that's a great summary. I think the only thing I would say is feel free to let us know if you think um, you need assistance on how to identify um, sub parcels of that um, and or work with other agencies that might be managing some properties that you own or if there's co-management, ownership, et cetera. We're happy to help discuss how you might go about that most efficiently for your case. All right. There's another question I want to get to from Stuart. Is there a template or guideline for what con constitutes an adequate management plan for elevation from gap three to gap two? Um, and I can kind of kick this off and then you guys are welcome to add in. But I would say, no, there's not a template um, at the state level. We're really sensitive to intricacies at local levels or at different um, entities of what a management plan could look like. So we don't have a template or we're not looking for um, like a certain type of document, but there are different, definitely priorities that we're looking for in a specific management plan. 
Yes, um, thank you for the questions too. Good to hear from you. Um, I, I would add to that that we have gotten some additional guidance um, out of USGS. For example, if you are an LTA qualifying or accredited land trust, um, as long as you have the required management plans um, to be accredited, those count. Um, in themselves. Then the other thing I would say is that if you have one management plan as an organization that applies to all, some, or most of your properties, that's acceptable. It does not have to be one document, one property. Um, as long as there's clarity and there is uh, a connection between the two that's clear that can be defended, um, it's okay for one management plan to apply to many properties within there. Um, so there, as as we touched on, there are diversity of management plans. There is no official one. Instead, what we have are criteria of what must be contained within the management plan that makes it qualify or not. Great, thank you. And uh, just to answer uh, the next question, Jamie asked if uh, there's a lot of lands that are in the Bay Area that are showing up as gap four, um, but a lot of them could be possibly elevated to gap two or gap three. And he was asking about the outreach that we're doing to these agencies um, who are managing them, oftentimes counties, um, parks, districts, things like that. Uh, Lauren and I this summer, uh, these past few months, have been doing a lot of outreach with these agencies. We have reached out to many counties across California. Um, and so there is a lot of outreach being done to attempt to uh, increase or increase the awareness of 30 by 30 in the goals of 30 by 30 and also to get that land updated. Uh, that said, you know, you know, feel free to reach out to us if you work specifically with some of them or um, want to get involved in that process as well, because we're always looking for people to work with there. But there is a lot of outreach being done because as Amanda talked about in her presentation, you know, we're hoping to get new lands added to 30 by 30, but also get a lot of the data updated because oftentimes it can be out of date. Yes, and I will say you sort of caught me. Um, that image has not been updated since the latest release. Um, we knew the Bay Area was an area so that needed a lot of updates and uh, lands that should be qualifying. So if you look at the latest release of CPAD and CCED, you will note a significant change from the image I showed early, earlier. So apologies, I will get that updated also for a more accurate reflection in the next uh, presentation. But yes, we, we're certainly doing a lot of outreach and there were significant changes in particular in the Bay Area in this last release to include a lot more lands that do qualify. Awesome. We had and one more question kind of earlier in the chat asking, are there any related requirements around measuring and monitoring biodiversity over time? Either of you want to get that one? If I'm understanding correctly, I mean, I think the thing is that things need to happen at preparation perpetuity, hard word to say. So the land needs to be permanently protected into the future and the management plan needs to acknowledge that biodiversity will be prioritized um, now and into the future. So it, it's a bit of um, trying to be flexible enough to know that you can't know everything now, but you can know that you will prioritize that. That will be the main or one of the main objectives of the land or property. Not sure if anyone else has yeah. anything else to add or if, if you want to chime back in if I haven't fully answered your question. No, that's great. I just have one more note about how the gap codes are definitely welcome to be updated over time as a big part of our data outreach is, and is also about making sure we have the right gap codes. So if your organization realizes that maybe it was a two but should be downgraded to a three in coming years for any reasons, and we can definitely include that and are happy to keep our data accurate. Yeah, yes. there's there's no additional threshold to come back and change a gap code. So if you submit one tomorrow and next week you realize you need to update it, that's perfectly fine. There's not any additional threshold added within there. I will say if you're looking at properties in particular on the web tools and you see a gap code assigned and it doesn't feel accurate to you, that is uh, less so now, but occasionally still a remnant of us doing bulk applications that came from state and federal level data. So if you see a gap code assigned and you think it's incorrect, it's perfectly fine to just go ahead and reassign something new. There's no um, additional need to provide more info if you're changing a gap code versus submitting a new gap code. 
I'd also like to just reiterate that even though some properties maybe don't qualify for GAP Code 1 or GAP Code 2, um, they still can be doing really important work for conservation. Um, I saw a comment in the chat about ranch easements and, you know, ranch easements are really important for the environment for, you know, so many different reasons. And so just to, you know, make sure that everybody notes that just because the land maybe doesn't qualify for GAP Code 1 or GAP Code 2, the, the work that they're doing and the importance of them in the state of California is, is really important. Yes, and that's certainly reflected of regardless of your gap code. I would really like your information to be in and accurate in both CPAD and CCED. So most certainly that is critical information for us to know, especially as we look forward in terms of how we meet 30 by 30. Great. Right. The next question, the next question is what is the benefit of having land added to those under the umbrella of 30 by 30? Um, and I'm happy just to kind of start off with kind of the CNRA perspective on this. Um, having lands under the kind of conserved status of 30 by 30 is great for a few different reasons. First of all, California's state initiative is a great recognition for the individual organizations to say that your lands are included in this. You know, 30 by 30 is not used in a regulatory way. That said, it does help us really focus our efforts in the future and know where we should be looking more within the state of California to conserve lands. It helps us recognize where there is equity um, and where there's a lot of land that, you know, has different types of people and demographics that people have access to it and where maybe that doesn't exist as much. Um, and it helps us kind of focus state efforts going forward in terms of just where we want to focus all of our energy. Um, and as an organization, you can use the 30 by 30 data. You can you know look at this map and you can use that to show the, the great work that you all as organizations and different agencies are doing. Yes, and we definitely want to recognize the great conservation work being done across the state and in each county. And so if you feel like your lands aren't being properly represented in the data we have so far, we want to make sure that they are. So that's another big motivation of this push. Okay, it looks like we have a new question coming in um, more specifically about um, easements in LA County. Um, asking, we have many privately held open space easements in LA County without management plans that are probably in between gap code two and three. Should these be coded as three? Um, without more detail, I can't give you a definitive answer. I would say I'm potentially leaning towards three, but I would encourage you to review the information available on the CA lands website that will have more information as to which one they are. And also know that um, you can uh, move up to the two if you find that you do have management plans that apply or perhaps the agency um, with the conservation easement is LTA accredited, et cetera. So um, I think it will require, unfortunately, a bit more research, but do reach out um, if you find you need help on that, if you're not finding the resources and the link that was just provided. Great, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat, but let's, you know, people are welcome to try and come off mute if they'd like to give a question live. You can raise your hand um, if you go into the React and raise your hand, um, or you can also put something into the chat, and we're happy to address it that way if there's more questions. Yeah, and while we let folks sort of collect and raise hands if they do have questions, I, I'll reiterate that Green Info is here to hopefully make this process smooth and easier for you. Um, if you have questions about things today or if you have an idea that you may better contribute that will work better for you, please let us know, reach out. We are certainly flexible and open to receiving the information that you all know about your properties in a way that works for you. Great. I'm seeing a question, um, how do you demonstrate that you are prioritizing biodiversity and practice and for the GAP certification? And that's a great question. I think it looks different for all sorts of organizations and maybe it'd be helpful to give a few uh, like examples, but sometimes we see with grazing pastures, how those wouldn't normally be um, viewed as something that is preserving biodiversity or natural habitat space. But we also know how cattle are a great way to keep back invasive grasses or allow for um, water to filter through ground, sort of acting as that. So there's definitely um, 
ways in which land can be like prioritized for biodiversity that you wouldn't automatically assume. It's just if that organization recognizes that commitment to biodiversity um, that we're really looking for. And again, that looks different across all organizations. So it's definitely flexible. Um, I just put my contact info um, for if you want to reach me directly, um, feel free to use that. The one on the screen that I'm showing now is the direct link to the toolkit if you want to go see what your agency has currently in the databases, as well as the general uh, feedback. If you send the information to the C CPAD uh, email itself, it then goes to a collection of folks, so we might have a quicker response. Um, but you are welcome to email me directly or to this email or both um, for outreach. Feel free. Okay, I haven't scanned, but do are we caught up on questions in the chat, oh, Helen and Lauren? It looks looks pretty good um, as of now. Maybe we give it kind of another minute or so, um, and then we'll pass it off to Lauren to talk about some some future webinars. But feel free to add some questions if anybody comes up with anything. And later in the presentation, Ella and I will have our emails up on the screen as well. And you're more than welcome to reach out to us with questions. We're happy to answer them. And Amanda is a great resource for more of the technical questions about GIS or submitting on the back end. So if you have any questions more related to that, um, reaching out to her is a great um, option. All right. Looks like we'll be transitioning towards upcoming events, but again, feel free to put questions in the chat. So the biodiversity and habitat team at CNRA has some really exciting plans on the horizon and would like to take the opportunity to highlight a few of these and their upcoming dates and yeah. So on August 27th, there will be a webinar on strengthening tribal partnerships hosted in partnership with the tribal affairs team at CNRA. Um, then again, on September 10th, join us for a webinar to prepare for the upcoming Conference of Parties on Biodiversity, where we will work with partners to think about what it means to think global and act local. And then finally, save the date for our 30 by 30 partnership event happening October 3rd in Sacramento. Uh, you can find out about all these uh, events on our Instagram and our social media ch channels. Uh, also, feel free to sign up for our newsletter if you haven't already, where you may find more information about these upcoming events. The newsletter is such a great resource and a lot of fun. Yeah. I think we're ready to go to the next slide. Uh, thank you, everyone, for taking the time out of your day to come learn about data accuracy for 30 by 30 and how to contribute. Special thanks to Amanda Kohanek for the great presentation. Really appreciate your time. Uh, and we hope we answered all your questions, but if any more come up, just feel free to send us an email or reach out. Um, but thank you all. Hope you have a great day. <laughs>